This is joint work with my former intern, Ajinkia Kadu from uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and uh, my colleague, Petros Bufunos. And uh, today I'll be talking in particular about inverse scattering problems. Now, uh, before I continue, I just want, um, I'm hoping that people would be would feel comfortable to just interrupt me as I uh, go along if there are any questions or if there are any comments that, that need to be uh, shared. So uh, let me first introduce what I mean by inverse scattering. Now, inverse scattering is the process of estimating the spatial distribution of the scattering potential of an object from uh, scattered wave field measurements. And what I mean by that is um, we're trying to estimate the properties of objects by bombarding them with uh, electromagnetic waves and uh, measuring the scattered waves that are that propagate through the, the object, uh, and then uh, determine what properties those objects are made of. And we're gonna focus today on a specific property, which is the relative permittivity of these objects, and where we assume that our objects are lossless uh, in an electromagnetic sense. Uh, so there are three different regimes that we can, that we can define for this type of problem. Uh, one of them is the full viewer regime, where we have the transmitters and receivers surrounding the object, and we collect snapshots by moving the transmitter location all around the object. So these are uh, transmitters that are located in the circle around the object, and then we have receivers also located in the circle around the objects. And we want to, or we would acquire measurements from all of these receivers, and then process that data to recover uh, the relative permittivity of that object. The transmission regime is uh, more limited in the sense that you have an array of transmitters on one side of the object, an array of receivers on the other side. Uh, by the way, just to be clear, or uh, just to, to note, can everybody see my mouse? So when I point with to things using my mouse, can people see that? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, so the transmission regime, uh, as I mentioned, is a more limited version of the full view regime. And uh, the most difficult regime actually that we wanna address or we wanna, we wanna tackle is the reflection regime where we have the both transmitters and receivers located on one side of the object due to some lots of physical constraints. And uh, from the measurement of the scattered wave field uh, uh, on the uh, same, uh, 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 on, on the same side as the transmitters, we want to be able to determine the material properties. And uh, this type of, uh, Inverse scattering problem has many applications in a variety of fields, including, for example, optical, optical tomography, where uh, what you see over here are the, uh, the sweat glands reconstructed under the skin using uh, a form of this technique. Uh, another application that features uh, uh, reflection tomography is geophysical imaging, or uh, basically the, 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 the act of uh, locating minerals underground, whether it's uh, underneath, uh, for example, the Gulf of Maine, or whether it is somewhere in the desert and so on. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the applications that are more related to the medical business is this ground penetrating radar, where you build a device which has an, a radar transmitter on it and a receiver and you send pulses underground and then you're receiving reflections. And from that, you're trying to estimate or figure out what material exists underground. Is it a pipe or is it an air cavity or is there uh, water underneath the, the surface? Uh, so all of that can be represented or can be captured by computing the relative permittivity of, of the object. Another potential application is ultrasound imaging. So this is an example of uh, where basically the uh, ultrasound image of my daughter using conventional ultrasound imaging. And uh, this is what you can get after inverse scattering or maybe after the algorithm converges because it does take a long time, <laughs> not that long. So uh, let's formalize the problem a little bit more. Basically we have an array of uh, transmitters and receivers that are located uh, above ground. And we're trying to estimate the relative permittivity of objects uh, located underground. And generally, uh, the type of signals that you send are uh, basically electromagnetic pulses that are in the range of 10 megahertz to up to two gigahertz, for example. Uh, and the target, as I mentioned, is to estimate that uh, the, the spatial distribution of the relative permittivity. 
uh, in the subsurface. And here we're mostly going to deal with a two-dimensional scene, but everything can be extended to 3D. Now, uh, the physics that describes or basically that, that governs the, propagate, the electromagnetic wave propagation is captured by Maxwell's equations. And uh, one form of Maxwell's equations called Lippmann-Schringer equation is basically re rewriting Maxwell's equations in integral form and assuming that your background medium is free space. So what we have over here is we have the total wave field. When you can think about the total wave field as all the ele electromagnetic energy that exists inside the object as a result of having uh, illuminated the object by some incident wave field, which we will call V. So the Lippmann-Schringer equation says that U is equal to V plus uh, the interaction or the convolution of the Green's function with the total wave field U multiplied by our target uh, relative permittivity uh, distribution F. So we want to recover F and we have used V in to bombard the, the scene or the object. And what we measure is the propagation of the total wave field uh, back to the array of receivers. So we have measurements Y, which are captured by this equation. So if we discretize things and rewrite it in matrix vector form, we now have two sets of equations. The first one is a set of measurements Y uh, associated with each uh, receiver and transmitter and uh, indexed also by the frequency uh, at which we're measuring Y. So we have y omega is equal to h, uh, which is a discretized Green's function that maps from the uh, region of interest, from the domain we want to reconstruct to the uh, domain of the receivers, multiplied by uh, the element-wise product of the total wave field and the relative permittivity we want to reconstruct. And uh, given these measurements, we are also constrained by the physics, which says that the in incident wave field V is equal to I minus G diag F times U, which is the total wave field. And in this setup, uh, what, we, what we know are uh, the incident wave field V, we have the measurements Y, and we know, in a sense, the physics. Uh, so we have the, uh, the Green's function, the free space Green's function, and the Green's, discretized Green's function that maps from the uh, region of interest to the receivers. And from all of those, we want to be able to reconstruct F. So we can set up the inverse problem to reconstruct F, and we can define that as uh, least squares uh, minimization y minus h diag u times F, uh, subject to the constraint that uh, wave propagation must obey the physics, which is V equals I minus g diag F times u. And you can see in this that we have actually two variables over here, F and u. And u is defined everywhere in the domain, and it's also indexed by the frequency that we're, uh, that we're transmitting or that, that we're acquiring, whereas F is assumed to be uh, constant throughout all the frequencies, but it has a spatial distribution. So the question is, well, how do we, how do we solve this problem? Well, one thing we could do is to use variable projection where we would say that the total wave field can be given by I minus G diag F inverse times V, and we represent that operator with some operator B as a function of the unknown permittivity F, uh, which multiplies the incident wave field. And then we try to solve this uh, nonlinear uh, least squares problem, uh, which is defined by the calligraphic F. And uh, one way to solve that problem, or at least to find uh, potentially a, uh, um, a stationary point for that problem is to use uh, gradient descent, where the gradient is given by the adjoint state method. Uh, I would, I'm not going to go into what the adjoint state gradient exactly looks like, uh, but that's, that's, that's an approach that's very well established in the literature. Now, there are lots of challenges that arise specifically in this reflection regime and, or reflection tomography regime. So here I'm showing two uh, scenarios. Uh, the one on the left is the ref reflection tomography regime where the asterisk uh, represents the transmitter and uh, the row of triangles represent the receivers. So we're illuminating this object uh, by a pulse uh, containing only three, uh, three tones, two gigahertz, three gigahertz, and five gigahertz. Uh, and we're receiving measurements from the receivers. And so the left-hand side is the uh, reflection regime. The right-hand side is the transmission regime. 
And the reason that I'm showing this is I want to highlight the difference in the, um, in the type of uh, data that's acquired by the measurements themselves. So if we were to assume that we know exactly what is the total field so that the inverse problem that I show over here is now uh, basically a linear inverse problem. So assuming that U is known, in that case, we don't care about the constraint that we have here, and we're simply minimizing this objective. Then the reconstructed F that we get from that type of minimization uh, looks like this in the spatial frequency domain. So the left-hand side is the two-dimensional uh, frequency domain or two-dimensional spectrum of the reconstructed image from the reflex reflection regime. And the right-hand side is the two-dimensional um, spectrum of the reconstructed image acquired in the transmission regime. And one of the main things to note is that in the reflection regime, we ha barely have low frequency components, whereas the measurements are dominated by high frequency components, which tells you that in the reflection regime, what are, we're measuring are primarily reflections off of interfaces in the, in the object that we're, that we're trying to observe. Whereas in the transmission mode, we're actually uh, collecting a lot of low frequency information. So again, what that tells us is really that it is extremely difficult then in the reflection regime to, uh, to compute absolute uh, primitivity uh, values. And that's because all we're observing are, uh, are, are, are basically reflections off of edges. Whereas in the transmission mode, we have integral, we're integrating through the object. So the measurements actually contain that low frequency information. Uh, but alas, we're not in the transmission mode. We need to deal with the reflection mode. So what this tells us is that uh, if we were to simply re re use uh, least squares reconstruction without any prior information, it would be very difficult to actually recover the, the absolute primitivity of the object. So we end up using regularization. And uh, one of the regularizations that, that are suitable for this problem is total variation uh, regularization. And specifically, we look at this constraint form of total variation where uh, in addition to minimizing the calligraphic F function, we want to constrain the uh, reconstructed image to have a total variation norm uh, that's less than, than some tau. And here we're using the anis anisotropic TV. So it, roughly we're saying we're looking at a bounded uh, L1 norm of the gradient of F. And that's what we're using to constrain our reconstruction. Now, given all of this, uh, we have several challenges that we need to address. And I'm hoping to touch upon these four different challenges. I, so th the main thing is to consider the nonlinearity and non-convexity of the objective function as a function of f. Uh, the second issue is to come up with actually a computationally efficient solver. And the third issue, which should be evident, is if I don't know what the, the, the solution is, so if I don't know what the permittivity uh, map f is, how can I choose an appropriate tau in order to properly regularize my problem? And finally, and I really wonder if uh, we're gonna be able to talk about that, is uh, the conditioning of the forward operator A, uh, which is heavily affected by the, uh, uh, the, the maximum uh, permittivity of the object we want to reconstruct and also by the frequencies that we're uh, transmitting. So let me get into, or hopefully try to address the first three issues and then we'll see if we can cover the last one. Now, uh, to try to understand the, uh, the, the optimization landscape of the, the objective function that we're addressing, uh, let's look at a very simplified scenario where we have a circle with a constant permittivity, and let's call that permittivity C, uh, that's located in free space. And we're trying to observe, uh, or we observe that circle using five antennas that you see over here. Um, so this is, a, again, a very controlled scenario where the only variable that you have is a, it's, it's a scalar, uh, where we assume that we know exactly the shape of the circle. We just want to see how the objective uh, function changes as we change C. And what we see is that for low frequencies, and here, by the way, we choose C equal to 10. But what we see is that for low frequencies, if you look at the uh, objective function for individual frequencies, the low frequencies look very well behaved. Actually, you have at the 10 megahertz frequency, it's almost a convex, it is a convex function. Uh, 
at 50 megahertz, it all still looks convex. At 100, you start seeing the non-convexity in the problem. And then for frequencies above 100, 100 things are messed up. Um, the other approach to consider is to look at batches of frequencies. So let's say we can group together frequencies from 10 megahertz to 50 megahertz. Uh, and we still see that the blue curve looks like it's convex, uh, which is fine. Uh, and that's nice. If we look from 50 to 95, uh, things are still well behaved, but it, basically it's, it's not convex, but it's not too bad. But then as you move into higher and higher frequencies, you still see that the objective function becomes very difficult to optimize. Uh, now, if we group together uh, frequencies from the lowest frequency, and then we, we start basically adding one frequency at a time in our batches, what we start seeing is that the objective function is much better behaved. And um, you might think, well, why don't we just solve the problem for the lowest frequency and then uh, it looks like they all have the same minimizer. Well, the, again, this is a very simplistic scenario where we know the exact shape of the object and we're only limiting our uh, problem to be a function of uh, the, the single scalar, which is C. Now, when we increase the ground truth relative permittivity to 100, for example, now you start seeing that even in the very low frequencies, the shape of the, the, the objective function it becomes non-convex. But all of these observations led us to consider an approach where we would incrementally work through our frequencies as we solve our problem. So what we propose is this optimization setup, where uh, we go through uh, multiple batches of frequencies. And in each case, we would start with the lowest frequency, solve for F, and then uh, add a frequency to the batch, then warm stock or the previous F that we got, and then solve for F again. And the natural approach to follow for this type of uh, optimization is to use uh, a technique like pro projected or proximal gradient descent, where we compute a gradient step and then after that project onto the constraint, which is the total variation constraint. Um, now something, one approach that helps basically reduce the number of iterations is to use a quasi-Newton uh, approach where instead of just taking a gradient step, we would actually weight the gradient by the inverse or an approximation of the inverse Hessian. And that could be achieved through a technique like BFGS. And uh, you can add some line search to, to control, to make sure that you're always uh, decreasing the objective function value uh, to, to speed up the, the behavior. But uh, since we're actually dealing with a constrained uh, minimization problem, one of the issues that uh, quasi-Newton directions might have is that the, the taking the quasi-Newton step might push you outside of the constraint and then you would end up projecting back to the constraint set and you might actually what does happen is you would waste a lot of iterations that way. So instead we formulated another approach where we ensure that the descent direction always satisfies the constraints and that's uh, basically this algorithm that I'm showing over here. Maybe I don't need to go into it in detail uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, but primarily what we do is we set up the quasi-Newton problem with the constraints uh, included in, in the objective while we're looking for the search direction. And we use a uh, first order primal dual method to compute the descent direction S. After that, we uh, compute basically the, the, the line search step size that uh, monotonically minimizes the objective function. And, that's, and then we just iterate over and over again that way. So at least that ensures that the descent direction that we're choosing is, uh, first of all, satisfies the constraints and is still a quasi-Newton descent, descent direction. Now, so that would address two of the topics that I mentioned earlier. One of them was understanding the, uh, optimiz like the, the, the optimization landscape of, that, uh, of the objective function. The other one is how to uh, use an efficient um, optimization algorithm to solve the problem. Next comes the problem of actually figuring out how do we find tau. And for that, we, uh, we, we used the procedure that was initially developed by Ewood Vandenberg and Michael Friedlander back in 2008 for solving L1 minimization problems, and specifically the basis pursuit denoise problem. Uh, in that context, what they do is they, they try to, uh, well, basically they, they set up the problem where you would solve a sequence of subproblems. In each 
subproblem, you would estimate a, a constraint parameter tau. And after you solve that subproblem, uh, you're able to update the tau and then solve the subproblem all over again. And uh, just to take a quick detour on how that works, uh, basically what they say is their target is to minimize some function g of x, which is non-smooth, subject to the constraint that y minus ax is less than some parameter sigma. And generally, it is easier to choose a parameter sigma because that represents your noise level. So we have a lot of ways of estimating what would be the noise level, and, and, and that allows us to, to, to choose a sigma. So now, since we're after minimizing g of x subject to y minus ax less than sigma, uh, they recast the problem into solving or into minimizing the L2 norm of y minus ax subject to the constraint that g of x is less than some tau. And they start with a small tau. And uh, for each tau, they define a uh, value function phi of tau. Now that value function, in the, when, when g is convex, admits uh, a tight dual uh, problem uh, where phi of tau would be equal to the solution of that dual problem uh, when, when g is convex. And in this case, now you can write phi of tau in this form. Now what's nice about this form is that it tells us that I can actually differentiate phi of tau with respect to tau. And since I can do that, now I can come up with a Newton step for updating tau so that I find the optimal tau. So we adopt this procedure as it is, but we tailor it to our specific problem. And remember that in our problem now we're using uh, different frequency batches. So actually our objective function itself is changing uh, from one batch to the other. But what it really boils down to is that it's a procedure that allows us to choose a small enough tau in the beginning uh, when we're using lower frequencies in our objective function. And this is a process that is very similar to actually multi-grid methods where you start with a coarse grid and low frequencies and then you start refining the grid. The difference is that we avoid all the bookkeeping that's necessary to, uh, to, to ensure that the grids actually match appropriately. Here we just define a fixed grid, but we play around with the constraint parameter of, uh, on the solution and also with the frequencies that we're introducing in the objective function. So then following the, uh, uh, the approach that, was, that I just described earlier, that allows us to actually compute uh, updates for tau and eventually actually find the optimal tau for the specific problem. Um, I can get back to this if there are any questions later on, but uh, I'd like to move forward uh, before we run out of time. So this is an example of, or actually, basically I'm gonna show you now what, like how, how do we validate all of this? So we choose three different phantoms. These are all simulated data where uh, we place uh, transmitters and receivers in, in, in an array uh, above ground. Uh, forget about the Xs over here, even though that's negative. Uh, it's all relative. And uh, inside this region of interest, in the first case, we have this uh, Shep Logan phantom. And then in the second case, we have this Rhombus phantom. And then in the third case, we create a phantom which is uh, more similar to what you would find in an underground uh, radar imaging setup. And then we vary the maximum contrast for these different phantoms from one to 10 to 100. And um, uh, we're using frequencies between 10 megahertz and uh, two gigahertz in, in our measurement. Uh, so we're going to define now uh, four different reconstruction methods. One of them is the approach that we're proposing where we know exactly what tau is. So we have the ground truth tau. The second approach is uh, the, 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 the approach where we estimate tau as we go, but we know some estimate of the, uh, measurement, uh, the measurement noise. So in a sense here, we're minimizing the total variation norm subject to the, um, uh, the, the measurement uh, constraints. Um, oh, I just realized there's an error over here. This should be an L2 norm. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then uh, we compare our, the performance of our approach with the approach where you group together all frequencies and you assume that you know the true tau and uh, you see what that approach can give you. Basically, you just uh, use all frequencies that are available, all measurements that you have available, and you assume that you know exactly the ground truth uh, tau 
uh, and try to reconstruct the problem. And then we have uh, yet another approach, which is uh, commonly used in the literature, which is this recursive linearization, where you work with one frequency at a time and work your way up from the low frequencies to the high frequencies. So for the first phantom, uh, this is the performance that you get actually. So remember that the scissor is this, uh, uh, is the approach that uses all frequencies together. Uh, recursive linearization is the next one. And then these are the two approaches that, you're, that we're proposing. SF tau knows the ground truth uh, constraint and SF sigma does not. So you can see that uh, for low contrast, uh, scissor and basically all approaches except for recursive linearization, produce a good enough estimate. But then as the maximum contrast increases, uh, thing, things become much, much worse. Uh, but our approaches can still reconstruct a reasonable, uh, basically they, they, they have a reasonable reconstruction. And one other thing to note is that this is an extremely difficult uh, phantom for this type of uh, setup for the refraction tomography regime. Now, when we go to the other phantom, uh, the, 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 the rhombus version, you can see that, um, again, for the very low contrast, and by the way, I'm calling this very low contrast, but in reality, an F max equal to one is uh, an approach where uh, the Born approximation fails already. Uh, so this is low contrast in our high contrast regime. Uh, but bottom line is that you can see that uh, the uh, sequential frequency approaches that, that we're proposing perform really well, uh, even in the case where that tau is being estimated on the fly. And here are some numerical results, basically showing that the best performance is obtained by this, the SF tau in both cases. Um, and then next comes the SF sigma, except for this case where um, the scissor works really well. And that's again, because you have uh, a relatively low, con relatively low contrast. Now, uh, the next test is to see whether our approach is actually robust to mo mo model mismatch. So this is a non-inverse crime setup where we generate measurements by uh, using a finely discretized version of the, of the object. So we use one and a half times the discretization that we use in the reconstruction. Uh, but Despite that, you can still see that, and also we add uh, measurement noise to this. So we're looking, we're using 20 dB measurement noise. Um, but despite that, you can still see that. So this is the ground truth image and uh, both approaches uh, do really well in the reconstruction. And one thing to note over here also is, so this is showing us how uh, the total variation constraint is being updated as we go through the batches. And uh, the red line represents the ground truth total variation constraint. And you can see here how this SF sigma approach very closely actually uh, captures the, uh, the the true total variation constraint. Um, so with that, okay, good. So I do have enough time to talk about the conditioning of A. By the way, should I stop for some questions or should I keep going? Yeah, um, I think we we probably have time for a few questions. Uh, if if uh, otherwise, we'll certainly keep going. Yeah, Mike, may I? This is Ganesh. Please, hi. Sure. Hi. Hello, Ganesh. Please hi. go ahead. How, how many forward solves you do for this problem? Uh, so okay. that depends on the number of frequencies that, uh, that exist over here. And, um, for each frequency, so for each sub problem, we are computing approximately a hundred gradient descent iterations. Okay. So each gradient descent iteration involves, uh, the inversion of the PDE twice for the forward and adjoint, uh, uh, models of the PDE. So this uh, 100 or 200 number is based on the some kind of a convergence criteria you put in your code. Right? That's correct. Yes. And you, you choose a tolerance 10 to the negative 3 or something like that. And That's that correct. Newton, Newton stops it. Okay. That's uh, correct. So you're going with lipman schunger for forward solves. And... Uh, because in 2D, Lipman-Schwinger is pretty fast. I mean, there's nothing to really worry about it. 
-hmm. If it starts with 3D, I mean, doing in a sequential fashion as you've been doing yep. for 3D lip much longer. Uh, is it, do you think it's practical the way you're doing it, especially for mm -hmm. multiple frequency with a lot of the increase in the frequency where in, as the frequency is increasing, the machine but in 3D is very difficult, especially with lip much longer. Right. I mean, if, if you have time, then that would be great. So the idea is that this is not being uh, computed on the fly. You collect the data and then process it. Kind of similar to what they do with uh, geophysical prospecting. So you don't solve the forward problem. Is that what you're telling me? No, we do solve the forward What I'm saying is yeah. that it, it just takes a lot of time. But we do yeah. solve the forward problem. I so guess you your, your concern is the, is the uh, computational or, or memory uh, uh, yeah, because you're, you're not coming to the condition number. I thought that's what I asked you. I mean, condition number also plays a role, and then you need the preconditioners, yeah. and then it, it just goes on and on. It does. So there, is a, <laughs> there, is, there is a massive difference between 2D and 3D, and that's what sure. I was kind of trying to kind of highlight it. And also, your geometry is sort of relatively easier with the circles and the squares and the ellipse, for example. So that says that one can do something. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, so there's no approach whether it's been useful for a lot of bigger problem in 3D. That's what I said. Right. No, no, definitely. It's like computationally, it's a, it's a, it becomes a nightmare when once you get in, go to 3D. Uh, one of the things is basically we're doing the uh, 2D plus when we deal with 3D. So we're just reconstructing 2D slices and we uh, regularize with the previous reconstruction. That's how we're addressing the, the 3D case. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hassan, I was also curious just to how do the frequencies affect kind of what is possible in terms of recovering the permittivity? And then also, I guess a separate question is what how do the frequencies affect the algorithm performance itself? So that's that's an excellent question and it definitely leads up to what I'm gonna talk about next over here. So maybe uh, at least the second part of your question, the, yeah, the second part of your question is addressed over here. Okay. Uh, for the first part, uh, the frequencies, uh, I, I don't, I cannot tell you off the top of my head uh, what is the, uh, how am I going to say that? Basically, for what uh, maximum permittivity would I need a frequency that is lower than a certain threshold? Uh, I don't know if that was clear or not. So lower is better. L lower is better for propagation through material. Uh, but you lose uh, spatial resolution. Okay. So that there's, there's a trade-off between those. And lower is better for us to be able to compute uh, absolute permittivity values as opposed to relative permittivity. Well, um, this is an abuse of uh, notation or, or, or naming here. We are computing relative permittivity throughout, but that's relative to a background uh, medium. Uh, but in terms of uh, the permittivity between one layer and the next is mm -hmm. what is captured by higher frequencies versus uh, the actual value of the permittivity that's captured by the lower frequencies. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, thanks. And so there's a trade-off between those. So for your other part of the question, uh, and this is exactly what, uh, what the, the difficult part also, well, the other computationally difficult part of this problem is that for every uh, iteration of gradient descent, we are computing the inverse of A and A adjoint, where A is this operator that we're showing you over here, I minus G diag F. And for large uh, spatial resolution, actually, generally, we, we never form this operator A. This is all done in, in uh, functional form because G itself is a convolution with uh, uh, well, well, basically, it's, yeah, it's a convolution. So we, we, we apply everything using uh, Fourier transforms. Um, so now what that means is we're going to have to compute A inverse and A adjoint inverse uh, computationally, which means that you're running many, many, many iterations of conjugate uh, gradient to be able to, to compute these just to form the gradient of uh, the objective F. Now, when we look at the interaction between uh, or it's actually, yeah, when we see, when we look at how the, um, uh, the condition number of A is affected by the maximum uh, permittivity 
of the target f versus the uh, frequency in the frequency batch. Uh, you can see that very quickly the condition number becomes pretty bad. Uh, there are some bizarre things over here where it's not monotonically getting worse, uh, but uh, that's still something that we're not sure of why that's, that's the case. It could be that our specific problem that we're looking at is, uh, is kind of quirky, but it also could be because of harmonics and you know, things start uh, helping the, uh, the operator. But roughly what, what we see is that the condition number gets worse and worse as we, um, as we increase the frequencies and increase the maximum contrast. And these are numbers that apply to a very small grid, which is a 32 by 32 uh, uh, pixel domain. So as that domain increases, again, you're gonna expect that condition number to become uh, much worse. So there are lots of, th there's actually a lot of work on designing preconditioners for Helmholtz operators and also specifically for the Lippmann-Schwinger equation. Uh, but we wanted to go with uh, more data-driven approaches and one of them was, or actually, I can't say that we wanted to go with any of these because these are still under investigation at this point. Uh, so one approach is the randomized sketching and the other approach could be a, a learning-based approach which is, uh, which, which I will touch upon briefly and mainly uh, discuss what we've seen in the literature. Uh, so first of all, for the, um, let me see, okay, still have nine minutes. So for the um, uh, randomized sketching, one approach to, to utilize is to use, for example, a randomized SVD to build a preconditioner for the operator A. And with that, what we end up doing is basically we, yeah, we create a low rank, uh, basically we find that low rank, low rank approximation of the inverse of A. And from that low rank approximation, we build a preconditioner for A. And by using that preconditioner, uh, we can see that as the frequencies, this is over here I'm showing as the frequencies increase, uh, I'm listing the condition number of A versus the condition number of preconditioner times A. And then over here, I'm showing the uh, number of iterations that conjugate gradient requires. And you can see that uh, the preconditioner definitely helps. Like basically you reduce the number of iterations by an order of magnitude almost using that preconditioner. Um, now other techniques that, ha that people have adopted in the literature are uh, uh, basically using um, data-driven methods or specifically learning methods. So one approach, for example, assumes that uh, the uh, objects in the subsurface have certain shapes and they're just located and, and have different sizes. So for example, let's say we have um, circles of different shapes and sizes, not shapes, sorry, <laughs> circles of different sizes and uh, that are located in different locations underground. So they fix a, uh, uh, a measurement uh, architecture where you, know, you, you fix the locations of the transmitters and receivers, and then you generate um, uh, the, the scattered wave field for many, many different um, uh, subsurface images. And then using the, in, in the test case, basically. Is, so that first of all is used to learn uh, or to train this unit architecture, uh, which is then used to estimate the relative permittivity F just by applying uh, the summation of H adjoint multiplied by the, the, the measured uh, scattered wave fields Y. So that's one approach that, that that exists in literature. Another approach is to try to unfold the inversion of the operator A. Um, and with that, basically you just think about uh, unfolding the conjugate gradient iterations. And then instead of using the actual uh, matrices of A and A adjoint in that inversion, you, you just train them using uh, training data. And uh, that was shown to perform not too bad in the 1D plus case, actually. They never ended up doing the 2D case. Um, clearly now, one of the main challenges in these approaches is that you're either restricting yourself to a class of permittivity maps F uh, that, that exists in the training set, and then the other uh, limitation is uh, you're now fixed to a specific architecture uh, in terms of the uh, locations of the transmitters and receivers. Um, so this is one 
general approach that we're starting to investigate now. And uh, we have some results, but these are all still preliminary. So that's why I'm not talking about these yet. But um, overall, I would say if we were to wrap up this whole discussion with a take home message, the first thing is that it is extremely important to manage the frequencies in the uh, measurements that you acquire uh, in order to produce a, uh, a good reconstruction. Um, computational bottleneck is definitely invert inverting that Helmholtz operator, and it's still the computational bottleneck. And uh, what we are hoping to do is to be able to speed up that process using learning. So in a sense, what we are trying to do is to come up with flexible and lightweight network architectures that are able to invert that PDE very quickly so that we avoid basically this uh, uh, the, the large number of iterations that are required for conjugate gradient uh, to, uh, to converge. And uh, with that, I thank you and uh, I'm ready to answer any questions you may have.